This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Catherine Druckmann and Sean Powers and I are going to be talking about ethics and open source. Fun topic. That's coming up next. Our annual survey is going strong and we don't want to miss your feedback. Go to twit.tv slash survey21 to take it now before it closes on February 8th. The survey helps us understand our audience so we can make your listening experience even better. It'll only take a few minutes. Again, go to twit.tv slash survey21 to take it. And thanks. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 614, recorded Wednesday, January 27th, 2021. Ethics and open source. Good morning, good evening, good whatever it is anywhere you are in the world. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. Welcome, welcome again. Um, We have an unusual show this week. Um, I have uh, with me two co-hosts, which are actually co-guests. there they are, uh, uh, Catherine Druckmann and Sean Powers. We are a, a substantial percentage of what was Linux Journal for for decades, and uh, uh, and and so this is this is we're going to do a kind of review of what's going on in Linux and and um, and in open source and floss in general, free software, Libra, whatever it's going to be, and. Um, and also introducing something new for the show. We are going to open the show with a little bit of a week in review thing. Uh, we're going to actually do some homework during the during the week and um, and be prepared at least at the beginning of it for the 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 host and the co-host to talk about that stuff. Now this whole show is going to be that. So I'd like to open it um, uh, with Catherine because Catherine is a new co-host and and I should say by the way uh, she was our. Uh, our alpha tech person at Linux Journal, and in addition to that, um, she is the co-host with me of another podcast we do called Reality 2.0. She can talk about that at the end of the show. So, Catherine, give us a, a little background on on what you're about and where you are and all that. Hi, um, what I'm about? Well, you can see the background. I'm I'm super into the Drupal's. Uh, so yeah, by day I am a software engineer. I work with Drupal. Um, I have been a contributor to the Drupal project. Uh, I heart Drupal everywhere. <laughs> Drupal's great. Use it. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I do for the most part. Uh, occasionally every week, actually, uh, Doc and I get together and we do another podcast, which is really fun. I love to talk about open source and ethics and, and technology and culture and everything. And it's, uh, we have a lot of fun and even better. I like to talk with, uh, these guys who I used to work with for many years at Linux journal. So I'm kind of looking forward to doing this today. I, sh- I should add, by the way, that we were going to have Dries Beitert himself, uh, inventor of Drupal and um, and Catherine's boss, on today. <laughs> and be- we had to move that around because he is, in fact, moving in the world. And we had he wasn't quite set up yet. So this uh, we're sort of graced with an opportunity here. And hey there, Sean. And we're you're, you're still are you snowed in or you or is some other condition surrounding you in Michigan? No snow, but cold, just so cold. I mean, single digits is just no fun for anybody. So um, <laughs> that's it. I'm in Michigan, same as always. But um, yeah, looking forward to this show. I think it's going to be a fun show because, uh, yeah, it's like we're getting the band back together, right? Yeah, it is. It feels like the band back together. Did Do you have one of those electric dipsticks that you stick in your car to keep the uh, the oil from freezing or whatever? I used to have that when I lived in New Jersey. In, in New yeah, York. no, I just I, I'm not going to make a, have a garage a, old vehicle <laughs> joke. I don't have a garage. That's the worst. And oh, really? Where I live in town, depending on the day of the week, we have to park on alternate sides of the street for the snow plows. And if you don't get oh, yeah. your date right in your head, like which side I'm supposed to park on, it's a twenty five dollar ticket. I've gotten quite a few of these twenty five dollar tickets over the past two years. And um, I really wish I had a, gar- a garage to park in, but I don't. Yeah. In New York, they have uh, where we have an apartment. We have alternate side of the street parking. It's called, and it's very confusing. And everybody has to know about it. And it, uh, and snow. They, they suspend it for snow. But then what happens is you're 
car is literally buried underneath whatever the plow threw up there. It's really horrible. Anyway, um, I'm in Santa Barbara, um, and Santa Barbara, it, you might hear it in the background because the mic is pointed at my face, but behind that is a monsoon going on. We, uh, we've delayed the fire season uh, a little bit. So um, we're going to talk about several topics uh, today and sort of organize it this that way. Um, I've got the first one, and 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 the story um, is actually about a company called OpenBase, um, which um, you know, which which VentureBeat calls the, the, the at least the wannabe Yelp um, uh, for open source uh, software packages, and uh, it's gotten nice funding and. Um, and I, and I have to say, I haven't done that much homework on it, but I have background. Um, so because I, you know, worked for Linux Journal really one way or another from the beginning in 1994. And um, and I remember there was a company called Krugel uh, with, and there were several like it back in the aughts. Might have even been in the teens, but I think it was in the aughts that had an open source, um, an open source uh, uh, search engine. The, the whole idea is that you'd you'd search across. There was no GitHub at that time, so and so it may have been may have predated Git itself. It may have been back that far, uh, and there was a bunch of these, and and they all kind of almost made it. Uh, and now we have OpenBase coming along. The the an interesting thing for me right now, and it's sort of I'll put this in a sort of general way, and then we can I can throw it to uh, my companions here, is that the the evolution of open source has has gone from nobody heard of it. We just had had free software. The term open source was not used before really February of 1998. That's when a bunch of geeks got together and decided that open source is a better thing to talk about and talk to business about than free software. Um, and we needed more licenses than we had originally just with the GPL. And this was no disrespect to Richard Stallman and and the the free software people. It was just a way to um, broaden the scope of what one could do with software where the where the code uh, was was known and could be examined and updated and all the rest of it. And then it was a proliferation of licenses, a zillion licenses uh, uh, eventually, maybe not a zillion, but uh, an unmanageable large number of them, you might say, and the open source initiative. But open source has matured to the point at at this point where, um, and we've talked about the Linux Foundation some here. We've had guests here from the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation is is a, a collection of foundations that um, is itself large. It's a it's a big outfit. Half over half of the global two thousand, I am told, um, belong to and give money to the. Um, uh, and give money to the Linux Foundation. It employs Linus Torvalds himself, um, a number of other alpha uh, programmers, maintainers of various code bases, and involves itself in lots of areas where company where you need a lot of big companies to get along. And I'll tell you about something I was actually talking to my wife about this morning. She was very involved in Linux Journal too from the beginning, from before the beginning. She knew the founder of it before I did. She introduced me to it to them. Um, and we're, we're at a point now where there's a new ecosystem, I think, that wants to happen, where, where the big companies are involved and all the, all the individual operators are involved, and they all find a better place than they are now. We saw the beginning of this with basically with Microsoft, not so much throwing in the towel as just realizing, as IBM did 20 years earlier, maybe even maybe a little less than that, that they were an open source company, whether they liked it or not. And in fact, they better like it because <laughs> it's really working well for them. And and they are an alpha player in the open source world now. And that's, but that's almost too big a, uh, that almost puts it a little bit too much. There's an ad hominem argument here. Maybe it's an ad corporum argument, which is that because a big company does it, that makes it right. Or And that's not really what it is. It's that we have a whole different ecosystem now, and we're just working out what that is, and we're barely beginning to work out what it is. Licenses are involved with it. Um, ethics are involved with it. The original ethics that we had, which is inherently generous, um, going back to free software, what, what Richard Solomon wanted you to do was be good to your neighbor um, by having not only open source code, but you're conferring within that code the freedom to 
do whatever you want with it to other people. And and that generosity of, of spirit and that working kind of close to that is still in there, but it's not where it was. And uh, and so I sort of see a whole new ecosystem wanting to come out. We're sort of, sort of in the pupil stage of a different ecosystem. And all of the big organizations are part of it. Something like Open Base is part of it. Um, but anyway, that's not a very articulate way to put it, but why not? That's sort of a, a, a good place to start. So Sean and, <laughs> and Catherine, <laughs> what, what do you think of the hash I just made of not knowing exactly what I wanted to say about this stuff? <laughs> I, I think, uh, no, go ahead, Sean. I bet you have more to say than I do on that. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was just going to say that I, I think it's a, it's a great lead into the, the specific topics that we're talking about, because the, the issues that, that we want to talk about today are kind of part of that whole thing. Like, um, there's licensing, there's, there's ethics. And then, um, there's so much open source software, right? I mean, there's so much open source and, and not even that, but even in the same lane of software functionality, there's so many uh, options out there that it can be overwhelming to the point where it's like, you know what? I don't even, I don't even know. I'll just, I'll just buy something because at least then I, then I know I'll get what I'm paying for, which is just the saying that just burns my butt every time somebody says that about choosing a proprietary software over open source. Um, but yeah, I, I think that just because open source is, is so prevalent that we think it's a super mature idea and it is not right. I mean, we're, it's, it's just being invented. Like how, how do we do that thing where, where the the source code is available and yet people are making a living. We're, we're still inventing how that works. And as you invent those things, uh, ethics come into play and uh, the, the curse of too much choice comes into play. And you mentioned businesses, right? Just because a business is doing it uh, makes it right. The, one of the issues there too is if a big business uses a particular package, everybody wants to use that because they want to emulate that success. So I, I think that uh, if we start with the assumption that open source is still a young and developing idea, I think it, it makes for conversations that um, aren't necessarily right or wrong, but maybe are can be trailblazing or or enlightening. I think it also, you know, it, it boils down to a couple of things, right? M making money is hard, right? Making money is not easy. Making software is hard. Um, and one of the hardest things with making software is vetting, vetting, uh, your dependencies, vetting the, the stuff that you're using. Well, what is that? We, you know, Doc and I were actually, we had this conversation about, uh, there's an illustration that goes around with like a, a cartoon of, of somebody propping up this giant, uh, thing and it represents some abandoned project that you know hasn't been touched since 2011 or something and it's actually holding up the entire internet. Yeah. That's um, so you know th this process best, when yeah. you're writing software you have to vet everything that you're going to use and it, and and as software becomes increasingly complex, you know I can I can see the desire to solve that problem. You know th there's a um. There's a conversation I've been in lately around an idea that came up in a cabal that I work with um, uh, seven or eight years ago called Emancipe. And the whole idea with Emancipe is it's not a product. It's just an approach to payment where you start with full agency on the part of any individual where what you have is the ability to pay whatever you want for whatever you want, whenever you want, any way you want. And this actually came before – uh, cryptocurrencies. But the, the idea would be um, I could escrow a, a record of – escrow is the wrong word – but I could keep a record, for example. It started really with public radio and, and a new way to pay for public radio. And we actually created a, a code base uh, called Listen Log that worked within one app on iOS and Android that was able to keep track of all the public radio you listen to. There was this one app that did nothing but public radio and you'd listen to 10 different stations and you could look at the end of a period of time and see how much time you spent with each of them. And you could break that down as well if you wanted. What, what was I listening to? All of that kind of analytics that that the big companies are busy look, staring over our shoulder at, but you stare over your own shoulder. What was I actually listening to? And then with Emancipay, you would just simply apportion that out any way you wanted. You would just automatically pay this. Just how do you lower the threshold of paying anything for anything? And what's significant to me about this is that conversation on this stopped about seven years ago. 
And now it started up again. And I think it started up again because we're looking for optionality on our part. That's very much of a type that we have with open source. I mean, open source is all about optionality. It's optionality for you as a programmer, optionality for you um, as a as a product designer, as somebody who wants to include code within other things that there. But there's it's sort of optionality all the way down, rather than entrapment all the way down, and choice all the way down. But you have, but you control some of that. Say, for example, with a license or, or with a cost or whatever. But once you throw in the ability for anybody to pay anything for anything, um, uh, in their own way, and with the assumption that people might also be generous, because there's that generosity part of open source as well. You're, you're doing this because you want other people to inspect this stuff because. Nobody's perfect, and you really want this whole thing to grow in a way where it's unencumbered by any one party's um, narrow or parochial or selfish interests. And so trying to make that happen, I, mean, I just sort of feel like a, a it's probably COVID's done it to some extent, but there's a reset button that's being pushed right now where we're kind of starting to rethink a bunch of things that have been kind of tabled before. Don't all yell at once. <laughs> no, no, I'm still, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking about, I, I have my sort of like inner, inner dialogue going on. I'm still kind of thinking about this open base thing and, and, and the problems that it solves and, and just the process of, of vetting, vetting the things that you're using in your project. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I don't want to like take us off on a tangent. I'm just, you know, they, I'm kind of curious how, how you could kind of condense the process of, the, eval the evaluator, you know, what do you normally do, right? You go through, you probably look at commit history, you look at, you know, how active a project is, you look at, you look at an issue queue and, um, you know, I wonder how you could condense that into something a little simplified because, you know, a review process is such a complicated and, and uh, you know, issue that's potentially fraught with a lot of conflict and uh, abuse as well. I don't know. Anyway, it's something I thought about with regard the, yeah, to this it open seems base like, article. It seems like like reviews or or ratings are easy to game. And I mean, look no further than Amazon ratings, right? I mean, you know, we all look at, oh, I want the product with five stars. And then if you read some of the reviews, they're obviously canned five star responses or paid for reviews. I mean, how many times have you purchased a product and then uh, you like get a follow up email where like for a five star review, we will send you on a cruise. Not really that significant or I'd probably <laughs> right. do more five star ratings. But uh, I mean, it seems like that's going to be the thing. And then um, when you're when you're rating them, I guess it, it, their metrics are going to have to be adjusted to to take those things into account. But gaming a rating system seems easy. And Sometimes ratings aren't great. Do you remember the, and maybe they're still around, so I'm going to like offend people. Um, do you remember clout? I think that was it. Clout with Twitter. Oh my like God. Your, your yeah. clout Ew. score, like yeah. how important yeah. you were. What a, I thought that was the stupidest thing it in the world. It made no sense. But, I, I had twice the clout of Tim Berners-Lee uh, with that. And it made no sense. It's just that I tweeted more than he did. Yeah. It and silly. so it's just, yeah. it just feels like a system that is, is ripe to be gained. But at the same time, it is something that's needed because otherwise you're just going to use, uh, you know, you're going to go on your own set of ratings. Like what's the most popular uh, GitHub repository that's had the most polls or, you know, all, all of those things. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a something that's needed. So I hope the folks at OpenBase can really come up with a system that uh, that is reliable and useful and not easily gamed. Maybe I'm a pessimist yeah. for the day. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting because I mean, it wasn't they that called themselves the uh, the, the Yelp of uh, of of <laughs> the Yelp of open source. Yeah, that's true. But that's the metaphor that we have, and I I mean, I know restaurants that and other businesses that have been hurt by Yelp because you know uh, they've been shaken down for Yelp ratings supposedly, and um, and you're right. I think any any review system is probably fairly easy to game. In in Amazon, I never look at the five star reviews. I look at the four threes and twos, you know. The the ones are always it came broken or it came in a broken package, and the fives are always full of praise and nothing else, um, and and nothing is perfect. And and but and actually, when I give a review, I don't give a five star review. I give a four star review because I think it's going to be more credible than a five star review. So that's another way that this stuff. That there's a sort of weirdly social aspect to this, but one of the things that's so wonderful about open source is that is is the whole maintainer committer it's not so much a hierarchy as as a as a as a 
a way to flow code into a into a code base is itself a pretty good system. It's a pretty proven system, and um, and it's based on merit. It's not based on 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 some other caste system that's popularity or or something that's more easily corrupted. Um, so but I, but I, I, go ahead. So here's a question: Do you think React JS would be as popular? If it was, you know, just a grassroots thing that came from some Joe Schmo, uh, or is it because of its its roots, you know, that uh, Facebook, right? Correct me. I'm not a developer, but I think it's React JS is a Facebook thing. Um, it is that why it's so. Is it Facebook or is it Google? It's a huge company. I don't know. I'm starting to be self conscious that I got the name wrong, but um, it it comes open sourced from this huge uh, platform. Is it that much better, or is it popular because of its roots and if so maybe maybe open base is going to help with that maybe something could get better ratings even if it's not as popular if it's better at certain things i don't know i don't know so we're so we're, we're trying to divide this up into Sorry. several topics and so that that was my story about open base it made me think we have to have open base on this thing on this show so we'll kind of bookmark that so, Catherine, you've got you've got a story as well. Yeah. So, so you know there there is a there is an impossible situation, and that is separating technology from politics. <laughs> That's how I'm going to put it. That's how we'll start. And that is so. There's there's an effort uh, in the software community to restrict the use of the software that you create to only ethical purposes. And that's impossibly complicated in and of itself, but um, I, I do think, you know, it's, it's, it's worth talking about, certainly. Um, yeah, so I see it, you know, it's up on the screen now. So there, there, are, there are some groups putting uh, behind uh, some new non-open source. I think we need to get that out of the way. They're, they do not, these new licenses do not meet the definition, the established definitions of open source licenses. Uh, the idea being is that you you actually, they don't want the, um, freedom zero in that they want the ability to restrict who can and cannot use the software. So obviously that, that can't be open source, but they argue that maybe it can. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's much discussion to be had around that. But I think the more interesting discussion is the why. Uh, why is this? Why is this something that people feel is necessary right now? Um, I think, you know, we've all probably read about various tech companies um, uh, refusing or ending contracts, refusing to work with or ending contracts with ICE, for example. Um, you know, employees threatening to walk out. Uh, so, so in order to sort of head those kind of uh, conflicts off, uh, the, you know, I, I, I think there's this movement. Um, I don't know. That, that's something that I, you know, I think would be fun to talk about personally. I mean, I, you know, I have no love for ICE. Uh, I don't want to get too too far into the politics of that, but I, I, I definitely understand and respect the motivation here. Um, but at the same time, how do you like who who decides? Like, how do you define, um, you know? How do you define the uh, the entities that are acting in an ethical manner? How do you define what that ethical manner is in order to allow them to use your software? I think that's that's incredibly difficult, and, and there has been an effort to to define those things in in terms of this license. But um, I don't know. That's I think tough, that, that's problematic. What do y'all think? That that is tough, and um, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's. I mean, it's because I, I think traditionally the thought is. Uh, well, software or or technology isn't the thing that's going to to do the evil, right? Uh, guns don't kill people; people kill people. Uh, so I think that that ha maybe, maybe it's expired. I think that's the argument that that this article and this movement is making is that we're past the point where um, we our software is no longer um, uh, can be weaponized. That, that sounds horrible. I don't know, but uh, to the idea of Releasing your your software and having it used for something that you find morally reprehensible isn't very unpleasant feeling. But again, that that's open. So um, I, I like you, Catherine. I understand the motivation. Gosh, it's just it's a it's a tough um, it's it's a tough line to to find there because who who gets to decide 
what's ethical, what's not ethical. Is it the, I mean, is it the person who wrote the software? Can, can that person be the person who says you can use it, you can't use it? And if that's the case, it's definitely not open. So I don't know the answer. I certainly see the, the, the struggle, the frustration, especially if you're a developer and you see your software being used for things that are just horrible, even things that just you think are horrible, that that's a tough place right. to be. I don't have an answer. I just, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm with you. Like, man, that's. Yeah. So, I, I, so I this particular answer. license points at. Oh, Doc UN has an answer. Oh, Doc go has ahead. an answer. Okay, continue, so Kath. No. Well, no, well, just go ahead, Catherine. You're going to particular... say something. And I don't want to interrupt that because uh, you had a thought. Well, they, they, they point to um, a UN Council on Human Rights or something. They, they, they point to an actual UN definition of human rights violations and stuff like that. So they have attempted to define it. But even still, you know, I, I still find that to be, um, I don't know, I, I, too problematic to, uh, to grapple with. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, um, I, I think that actually there is um, – there's an ethical basis in open source to begin with, and there's an ethical basis to free software, and 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 the ethics again is a, a kind of generosity, and it's a you you build into the, the fact that the code is available and it's free and it's um, free as in freedom and not as in beer and all that uh, is an ethical basis. The, the, the ethics are there. I don't think you can improve on that. Um, I, I think you can chop it up into different licenses and things that that make a particular code base appropriate or more or less appropriate for different purposes. But um, but that's that's more of a pragmatic consideration. But at the base of it, um, free software and open source and Libris, as we put the L in here in 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 uh, uh, in floss, it, 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 there's liberty to it. it. It's that's an ethical basis. And I think that's as far as it should go. I think every single technology you can name has bad uses. It doesn't matter. I think it's good right. to be conscious of the stuff that uh, the ethical source people want you to be conscious of. That you know we're in a you know we're in a, a a time of of change and and there you know there are lots of things to be care, caring about. They mention you know racism and mass surveillance, anti-immigrant violence, protester suppression, racism, blah blah blah. blah. Um, Code is going to be used for everything, absolutely everything, and they're just simply bad uses for everything. And you invent a hammer, you know, and um, the Beatles will write a song about Maxwell's silver hammer <laughs> whacking people on their heads, right? That's that's what – everything that can be used as a as a tool can be used as a, as a weapon. And um, uh, Marshall McLuhan, uh, at the moment my favorite philosopher, because I think he explains a lot about what's going on in the world right now uh, – points out that every new technology, every new medium reverses or flips into something bad. You're not going to get away from the bad stuff. It's going to happen. And especially as it gets toward ubiquity, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure that, that, um, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook, he did not intend it to be what it's become exactly, probably intended it to make that much money perhaps, but not to do it exactly the way it does, but it's too late. You know, it, it, it's it's fixed in its in too many of its ways. Um, same with any big company you can name; it can be used for all kinds of bad things, uh, and and we can't get away from it. I think it's great to be mindful of this stuff, but I don't think you can. I don't. I, I I'm I kind of chafe at the idea that I'm gonna I'm gonna cripple this software in such a way that it can't be used by bad people in bad ways. I think that's sort of implicit in what they're saying, but I haven't studied yeah. it enough. Yeah, I think it is. And I, I think there are a couple of things, though. I think one is I think we should collectively consider that there's a better solution to the problem that isn't that doesn't involve um, licensing, that doesn't involve, you know, adopting a new license. I think that's a possibility. And I think the other thing is maybe we need to think of the par of a parallel with, let's say, privacy and security. Like, um, for example, you know, we, we talk a lot about how there, there's there's no way to only give uh, a backdoor to the good guys, right? So you're either everyone is secure and and private, or no one is. So it, it's the same thing. You either you either allow everybody to use your code, or or you know, or it's proprietary. And then then you you get to pick your your customers. Um, so to me, it's kind of it's a kind of a similar thing. Where is if we all want if we all want to protect our right to privacy and security, it's kind of, it, you know, we all also similarly want to protect our right with regard to software freedom. So in, in, 
by the same token, you know, by protecting our right to privacy and security, yes, we are we are also protecting other people's rights to do private things that we don't like and and keep those hidden. You know, we 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 in order to protect our own security, we don't want to give law enforcement back doors. I mean, I don't personally because I think that's that's far too risky. But 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 at the same time, that allows uh, that hinders the process of of uh, rooting out bad behavior. So I think this is a similar thing. You know, I think we in order to protect the integrity of of the licensing and and the concept of of software freedom, I think you have to just accept the fact that uh, code is going to be used for bad things. There's a, uh, um, I, I, I've, I see it as sort of an iron law in in technology is that what can be done with it will be done with it until we see the things that shouldn't be done with it. And uh, the, the most dramatic example is nuclear power, right? We we saw what could be done with it. We blew a couple cities. We never did it again. We threatened to. We never went there. And and there, you know, and, and since then with nuclear power, we've also discovered that, well, you know, keeping something that will will not decay to 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 harmlessness in thousands for thousands or millions of years years is not a good thing to have, and not not only in your backyard but anywhere in geology. So, um, so there's that as well. And um, but I'm seeing here that you, what what they want to do is ensure that our work is being used for social good and in service of human rights. I think if you design it to do that in the first place, and I think most open source code that we know of does that kind of anyway um i mean what i mean i, I guess i mean I, I suppose if you're creating software that has that as a first purpose that's great and if it has it as a secondary or tertiary or quaternary purpose that's fine too uh but i think enforcing it they say you know and they want to enforce fair ethical community-minded terms for those who benefit from or are affected by our work I, I mean, that, that strikes me as unnecessarily restrictive and and doesn't respect that sort of iron law, which is what can be done, will be done. Doesn't matter. You could try all you want to make it not happen. Somebody's going to find bad uses for it. And some of those bad uses will have good purposes in the beginning, and then it will turn out to be bad in the longer run. So, um, so I, 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 you know, I, I kind of, I don't so much stand against this. I kind of, I kind of stand with the spirit of it, but with with a big question mark in front of and the word enforce i i'm not sure i like enforce in there or how what how that would be done but maybe they've so thought it, about it far more creatively than i have so okay let's let's say then it's not it's not a, a software license that that protects from usage like that where where does that responsibility lie um i mean and i could come up with um okay let's say i have an open source weather api okay and uh, I, and I'm not a developer, so maybe that's not even a practical thing, but somebody uses it to make an app uh, and it says, hey, it's sunny out. It's a good day to beat up immigrants. And, and that's the app. OK, now, obviously, I wouldn't want my weather API put into that into that uh, app. But if it's, you know, the, if it's an open source license, they can do that. You know, that's that's fine. So then is it the responsibility of the platform to uh, ban an app like that? Uh, and then if not, what about the, um, is it just the responsibility of users not to download the app? I don't know. I, I feel like if we're a society, there has to be some level of, of vetting of what we're going to, uh, I don't know. I mean, I allow is, is against the idea of freedom. It's, it's a sticky situation. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I think that if people were to think through all of their, apps and their code that they release open source and realize, okay, this might be used for something bad. Maybe that's just a warning that we should make sure everybody who's yeah. considering releasing <clears throat> their code, you know, this could be used for something horrible. You should know that. Um, because yeah. once it's out there, people are going to use it for something horrible. I I don't know. I, yeah, I, I hate to just fluff it off and say, no, no, that's not what, you know, licensing that, shouldn't, shouldn't address that. It's just not something we should address because it should be addressed, maybe not at the license level, but doggone it, there, there should be some sort of societal vetting of what is dangerous for humanity. You know, there's a... Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, that's happening right now. How's that? And so is, is that the... Is well, that I just mean the, Is it the, better for it to happen at the platform level, like, you know, banning apps and that sort of a thing? 
Yeah, that's that. That's what I meant by that's what's happening now. I mean, okay. you know, I think we are. Everyone who works in technology is actively involved and in thinking about, you know, how to address things like content moderation. How how to, you know, what 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 does deplatforming mean exactly? And 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 when do you when do you uh, do you use that in against um, bad actors? I don't. Know, it's it's such a complicated thing. I think it, Doc's the one who always says everything is political, right? <laughs> So. Well, no. Well, it's it's political in a sense that I mean, what I, what I once said when I was when I was managing a small company, wherever two or more people are gathered, at, wherever the three or more people are gathered, at least two are engaging in politics. So we're doing it right now, maybe because there are three of us here. Right, yeah. um, there's um, a, a, a couple of things. First, um, I think. I think that I mean, if if you remember the end of uh, Silicon Valley, the the TV show Silicon Valley, if anybody's watched yes. that, which I highly recommend, it's brilliant. I I lived in Silicon Valley for decades, and it nails it in so many ways. But it ends with exactly this kind of thing: the 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 the, the company that is followed throughout it called Pied Piper, you know, one of the developers, and they de- realize what they something to develop. I think what it did was it was kind of like an Ice Nine or an Andromeda strain where. While they did one good, one or two good things, it would also basically allow anybody to solve everybody else's crypto and or something like that. And and so there could be no secrecy. And and they said, you know, we're going to kill it. We're going to kill it, and we're not going to let it live. And so they made an ethical decision. And 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 I think that that's a um, uh, I think that that kind of mindfulness needs needs to be there. It was that that was kind of the the final point of the show. These people were mindful of their uh, of the of the potential of what they were doing, and of course, I mentioned you know Ice Nine, which is a, um, uh, a Kurt Vonnegut um, uh, invention, as it were. It was a literary invention, but basically, it, it, it was an invention that that changed the the freezing point of water to below room temperature, so the whole world froze, and it was the end of everything, <laughs> more or less. And that was the thread of it, uh, and it was invented in a kind of innocent way by some scientist that wasn't thinking out the possibilities. Uh, Andromeda strain is a similar thing, but I, I wanted to put attention to um, since we're talking about ethical source dot dev. I like the dot dev um, uh, domain uh, domain suffix, by the way, S- slash definition. So their their list of definitions. They do have a definition, just like the OSI has a de- has a definition. Um, it benefits the comments. It's created in the open. Its community is welcoming and just, and just, I should say. It puts accessibility first. It prioritizes user safety. It protects user privacy and encourages fair competition. And I'm especially interested in the first one. It benefits the comments because, um, you know, I've been a, I was a visiting scholar for a year with the uh, the Ostrom Workshop and Eleanor Ostrom, kind of. Uh, she won a Nobel Prize for her work on the commons and studying what makes a commons and these eight principles of the commons. And one of them is that they're basically self-reinforcing, that a, a working commons has its own enforcement mechanism built in. I actually think that every every open source code base that, that's developed by more than one person is a commons and and has that enforcement mechanism built in in the, in the way that, you know, that code is submitted and bugs are uh, stamped out and and doc and and you know things are documented. Uh, I mean, I think it's all. It tends to all be there. They are different. Uh, they differ by personalities. They differ by structure. But but they're but that system is in there. But a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily in there. Um, and and I think I think as a set of principles, um, I think these are these are a nice set of principles to keep in mind. And I think it would be interesting if to say they were say, to work with our first uh, topic here um, on, uh, on, on with OpenBase, you know, or something like OpenBase to reward in some way um, communities or people that that are, you know, complying with these th- th- these uh, these principles. I'm not sure it's a, it's a definition as much as a, as a set of principles, but they're good principles to have. I like them. You got to have some we principles, to, right? <laughs> so, always good to have some principles. <laughs> so, uh, I heard somebody <laughs> described the other day as they're so skinny they were fatless, and I thought, oh boy, that's interesting. Is it was so somebody could be without principles? It'd be principleless, whatever that is. Anyway, so so Sean, you have a third a third topic yep. for 
principles. Sweet. That's that's a good segue, actually. So the the topic that I want to talk about it's um uh, talking about open source licensing, um, and so th- this comes from the Elastic thing in in AWS Amazon, right? Where um, they uh, Elastic was unhappy. I think how much money Amazon is getting from their product, and they um, are changing their license. And then Amazon is forking it so that they can keep using it the way they want to. But really, it, it points to a, a bigger issue. Now, Catherine, one of the things that you said at the very beginning of the show was that uh, making money is hard, making software is hard, uh, making money with open source software maybe even harder. Uh, and and I think that that really is the gist of this situation. Um, there's a couple ways to monetize with open source. And, and again, open source is still pretty young. So we're still uh, inventing how those things are. But, you know, one of the one of the first ways to monetize open source uh, would be to provide support for paid support. Right. I mean, that was the you know, the software is free. Pay for support. It turns out that's a pretty crappy way to go about uh, making money with open source because because the Internet. Right. I mean, because the support systems are out there uh, and paying for it maybe works for a couple situations, but it's just not a, a great platform for that. Uh, another way to uh, to make money with open source is the um, like the core is open. And if you pay, you get additional services on top. I think that's probably a really widely used model. Now there's a lot of like firewall appliances that are based on Linux. They use Linux as their firewall. And to if you pay a certain amount, like a subscription or a fee, then you get more services, which are proprietary, more more software packages. Some of those are proprietary that go on to the open source thing. So it's almost like you get a little for free. And then if you want the whole package, you have to pay. And then the cloud has provided this third incredibly lucrative way of going about it. The software is free. You're not paying for use of the software. You're paying for using the software on our servers. And then you are paying for service, right? I mean, that's really the model that cloud computing has become. And what's happened then is these open source projects are being used by the big cloud servicing companies. Those cloud servicing companies are making money hand over fist. And the open source projects themselves who did the developing and the testing and the uh, all of the things are not making money, even a, even a sliver of the money that the big cloud hosting providers who are using their software get. And I mean, I understand why Elastic is angry, right? I mean, it's pretty easy to understand. If you are providing uh, this software and somebody else is profiting hand over fist and you find yourself hoping you can make your mortgage payment, <clears throat> Well, that, that's a tough place to be. So the idea with the article is maybe we need some new sort of licensing um, that hasn't been invented. Now, there is some, uh, what is the MongoDB? It's like server-side server, server side licensing or something where uh, you're, you're allowed to use it, uh, but not if you provide services to third-party people or, or something like that. I'm not sure that that is the answer. Um, uh, I think that's what Elastic is switching to. I could be wrong there. I know that's what MongoDB uses. Uh, but uh, it, it's an interesting topic. How do how do we solve that problem, right? I, I mean, or is it a problem? I mean, is this just, you know, capitalism is what capitalism does. And if you're using somebody else's open source project better than they're using it, all you know, all the gold to you kind of thing. So I, I'm curious your, your thoughts on uh, open source licensing as it pertains to this kind of a scenario where there's tons of money to be made, but not necessarily by the developer. I mean, it's a complicated Boom. problem. And, and I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Go ahead. yeah, I mean, I think any, I think it, when, when you're talking about these cloud, uh, things like databases that, that are so important to cloud services, I think as far as I understand it anyway, the contributor, um, the, 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 the contributor stats are so heavily weighted um, on the side of like maybe one company. Like, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned Redis Labs earlier. I don't know if we were on yet, but but I believe Redis Labs in particular, when we talked to them, they said that their their company, I think, was was responsible for something like ninety nine percent of the code, something like that. So so when you get into that. When 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 the the distribution is so out of whack, 
you know, I can I can see in particular, you know, those companies, you know, getting resenting an AWS giant for, you know, they they benefit from all the work and then they, you know, and they don't have the the weight of having to to spend the money on on development and but at the same time, you know, this is kind of what what we signed up for. But then, you know, these things evolve. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say what's the right answer. I, I symp- certainly sympathize with the problem. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, 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 you what are we going to have, like 12 different open source adjacent non-open source licenses? I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me that the, uh, that the piece in InfoWorld um, – which I think uh, may have been on screen earlier. Um, for those of us who can look at this, <laughs> it it doesn't matter. It's a but anyway. If you uh, there's a story by Matt Assay uh, in InfoWorld because we entitled "We Need a New Way to Think About Open Source." And what's interesting about this to me is the personalities involved because I've known Matt for a very long time. I've not seen him in recent years, but um, he was a primary source for me and a and a companion at at trade shows. Um, uh, back in, in Linux Journal, back in the, around the aughts in the early teens. Uh, and he works for AWS. He's got a pretty high-level job at AWS. But he's been with a lot of other things. In fact, he organized his own conference on Linux and business, uh, which was my beat, basically, with Linux Journal uh, for many years. Um, and and he's, a, he's a generalist, and he wants everybody to get along. And, and, and basically, his appeal is toward... Um, you know, is 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 toward thinking in a more macro and generous way. It kind of it kind of dovetails with, with the ethical topic. You know, what what are we doing for us rather than what are we doing for us in a larger sense than, than than the narrow sense. But then you do have problems like you mentioned, um, uh, with Redis Labs where you've, you know, where one company is, almost entirely it, it is the, one nearly and one hundred percent contributor to code and. And they're solving their own problems, basically. They're trying to solve it for the world. They're mostly solving it for themselves and with something that works well for the world. So it's hard to say. I mean, but I but I, I, I really like where Matt comes from here, that he's sort of putting it out there. Hey, look, I work for AWS, but I'm an open source guy. Um, and he's sort of suggesting this shared source license, which I have not, um, you know, the SSPL, we have shared source, but not with cloud providers. But I mean, this is a, there's a lot to think about here, and I think that, to me, the important part of this is the personal part. It's that, it's that he wants what's right for everybody, whatever that is, and and getting getting competing um, interests that that are, don't just compete, but actually are at odds. I mean, sometimes you just simply have have personal or group interests that are at odds with other groups or other people, and and tug a, a code base in one direction or another. For that reason, um, what starts out as scratch your own itch turns into how do we scratch everybody's itch, but some in some way that we want to be, you know, in ways that we want to be fair or good for everybody. And I'm not sure it can be good for everybody, but at least having being mindful of of what works in general will help uh, working on what works in particular. Uh, so anyway, a shout out to Matt if he's listening to this. <laughs> It really does just point to how young the open source model is, especially with regards to cloud services, which are even younger. You know, I I am positive that when the uh, you know the GPL was written, cloud services weren't weren't considered because no, no such thing existed, right? So, uh, does that mean that new licenses? I mean, how many how many licenses are there already out there? That uh, there's just a ton of open source or open source adjacent, I think, to use your words, Catherine, uh, <laughs> licenses uh, that already exist. I mean, I think Elastic, uh, I could be wrong, but I think it's uh, the, uses the Apache license and they're switching to the the SSL, I don't even remember what the new license is, the one that MongoDB uses. Uh, and so AWS is going to fork their project and they're going to keep their fork, which has a different name, I don't remember, um, in the Apache license. But I mean, how, there's just so many licenses already. And there comes a point where um, for the normal person on the street, all of these licenses 
are just nuances that you don't really think about. But I, if you are a business who uh, uses open source, creates open source, switches open source, um, or switches open source, I don't know where that came from, uh, where, who uses open source and, and shares it around, I, I can see where the licensing does make a big difference. And that's probably why there are already so many licenses out there trying to um, scratch an itch or cover a spot that is getting scratched. You don't want scratched or itched. And and I I don't know, but I do think that this isn't the, the last that we'll see of some open source struggles with cloud-based services that are reaping tons of rewards from their product. But I mean, this is just a, a software version of it. If you're a rake company and somebody buys your rake and they make a ton of money raking people's lawns, you know, it's not the rake that's making the money. It's the people who are raking the lawns. So um, it's not a perfect metaphor because you actually have to buy the rake. People aren't giving rakes away, uh, but it's, it's not a new problem. But I, I understand um, where Matt is trying to come up with a solution that is beneficial to everybody, not not just, you know, stop AWS from making money and not just, uh, you know, make sure that Elastic gets their share, but where everybody is happy uh, and everybody, you know, is uh, fairly compensated or at least, you know, has some say on, on how things are done. So uh, like all of the other topics today, I don't think that we have an answer. Uh, it's just something that we need to be talking about and considering and thinking through it as we move forward as a society of technologists it's interesting yeah, and i think you know go ahead say catherine oh sorry i was gonna say to further complicate things there's there's also you know the reminder that the people working on the people putting in let's say 90 percent of the effort on the on certain projects well they're also benefiting from open source software that that they're not you know necessarily contributing to you know how, what you know what id are they using what um Oh gosh, I don't know. Are they using Git? Are they using you can you can name a gazillion open source projects that they're probably using to create what they're what they're working on. So there's also there's a very deep well of people to compensate, you know, in an ideal world. And then the other thing is we haven't even touched on the idea of individual contributors. You know, we talk about companies investing in um, contribution, but we don't talk about you know, one uh, people that aren't necessarily affiliated um, that have just written some really great, uh, I don't know, JavaScript library or something, and and suddenly it's out there making somebody millions of dollars. But um, yeah, anyway, but you know, maybe they have a tip jar on their GitHub, or I can't even remember how GitHub works in that way. But but it's complicated, right? You know, there's a. Uh, um I think there's a, a a thread running through all these conversations, which has to do with ethics. And um, Matt Essay wrote another piece here that I think we already mentioned: of why open source needs more cloud. Now, of course, he works for a cloud company, uh, the biggest uh, AWS. Um, and and it's an interesting fact that um, a lot of us are using cloud not just because it's efficient in some ways, um, but because in fact it does take bad acting. Uh, it, it does counteract bad, bad acting. I no longer run my own mail server because uh, I couldn't get Spam Assassin to do as good a job as Rackspace could or as uh, as some other cloud, you know, host, uh, 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 hosting system could. Because as I, I'm sure 90, 90 X percent, maybe 99 point X percent of all mail traffic, everything running from SMTP to IMAP around the world um, is Spam. And and spam is bad acting and spam is a problem and filtering it out is something that is best or most efficiently done by somebody big. I think it's a, a huge reason why uh, Gmail works as well as it does. Uh, Gmail is as popular as it is because it's a way to get rid of spam. Now, people go on to it also because it's easy. But, um, but at the same time, and I'm doing my best not to be political about this, but it's an important point. It, you know, AWS kicked a somebody off their cloud, uh, they, they kicked a service off their cloud that was using their cloud um, because they felt it was dangerous. Now, it doesn't matter what the politics of that were. It, it What does matter is that a lot of the platforms, not just the cloud providers, but social, uh, social networks and so forth, did similar things in the same time frame. Um, and the whole notion that, w that uh, something big can, if, when we become fully dependent on giants, um, it's a problem. And I was involved in some discussions where you kind of have to face the fact that it is in fact giants all the way down. Um, because below 
below the AWSs and below the big platforms of the world, um, uh, you get um, you have ISPs, and an ISP can kick you off. Um, but below the ISPs, there are the backbone providers that go through the big exchange points where they're all peered together. And one of the reasons the Internet took off is because a bunch of giant backbones couldn't figure out how to do billing at the edges and said, to heck with it. We're just going to all peer. And that made the Internet we have now possible, the network of networks. But they all have acceptable use policies. This is one of the things that one of those big providers told me about the other day. They're in that business. And we actually have an acceptable use policy. We can, we can kick people off. Our backbone can kick, kick people off the internet. That's interesting to me. And, and, but that's an ethical thing. But who's deciding? Who's deciding is this big thing. The whole notion that the internet is in fact fully distributed and we're all free to do whatever we want on it is kind of not exactly true. And this, and I speak as one of the prime, you know, one of the best known cyber utopians out there. I mean, I am a died in the, the wool cyber utopian. I mean, that's what the Clue Train Manifesto, which I co-wrote, was about. It's why I got involved with Linux Journal in the first place. But there's some very non-utopian aspects to the geology of the internet that are kind of a little bit hard to face right now because any of these bigs can kick people off. They can kick organizations off. They can kick anybody off for ethical reasons, right? So we have to kind of face that too. Can we build a full, I mean, to me, that's a big question for the open source world. Can we build some fully ethical network? Is it possible to have a fully ethical network? Uh, and, and would a fully ethical network be the fully essentially libertarian one where anybody could be on this thing, just like anybody could use gravity, where the network actually can be like gravity or sunlight and anybody could do whatever they want with it. It's just that as long as they're doing, you know, that it's a grace that, you know, falls equally on everybody and nobody can get away from the fact that that grace is there like gravity. The Internet isn't that. And I thought it was. And that's sort of a epiphany for me in seeing what happened with deplatforming. So that's kind of a little lesson in there as well. And we are coming up. I think we have maybe about five minutes left. Yeah. So, so we, you guys, we haven't where do you solved think anything. we got? And, Right. I don't think we've solved anything today <laughs> other than bringing things to oh, the no, attention. I, I of really other hope people. we made it much more complicated. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah no. Raising because, the yeah, issue the, I, is, is our job, right? Yeah. I, I, used, like to, I used to have a, I, I was to tell you, there's a guy I worked with. He was one of the most brilliant entrepreneurs I ever knew. And I wouldn't tell you his name. He's, he's a fairly minor character at this point. It was like 30, 40 years ago. Um, but an employee of his said, his management style was to find a problem and intensify it. <laughs> so I think maybe that's what we just did here. I don't know. <laughs> maybe so. Yeah, talking about the internet not being that that platform of freedom that we yeah, – I, I agree. That's kind of been the thought like, okay, but the internet itself, at least that's the place where it's just a network of, of peers. But you're right because – and part of it is responsibility, right? I mean, ISPs have the ability maybe to uh, to not serve somebody. Uh, and it's ethical based, but also it's to protect their own interests as well. I mean, if, you know, they don't want to be the ISP that didn't stop something horrible from happening. But who watches the watchers? I mean, who who determines what, what is ethical in a, in a situation and, and what isn't? And I'm glad it's not me. Uh, but at the same oh, time, I was going to nominate you. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 not it. Right? Is that nose goes? Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. But it's something that we have to talk about, and I don't, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, it, I, I don't think the solution is uh, the government. But at the same time, you know, a collection of people who want the best for the larger community—that's supposedly what the government is. So I, I don't have an answer. Just more confusion. Well, and the question is then, then which government? I have a, a book yeah. over here on, on on European law. That Europe is kind of Europe is running the world right now. If if you are met by on every website by something that says we're using cookies and other technologies to sign here and click accept, thank GDPR. You know, and the government of California where I live, um, you know, because I have an uh, you know you can see my IP address or something like it. You can. You know, a, a, a site can see, oh, you're in California. Uh, you have to sign something. You have to click on something that says don't sell my data. Um, that's a that's the CCPA at work. Um, but then again, you know, and China is an exception to that, too. China, you know, has a very sphinctered Internet of its own that um, that that's highly restrictive. And 
you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's com- it's complicated. So let's, um, it's been an hour, uh, and it's been a really interesting hour. I'm really glad this worked out. Uh, so I think it's, we can, <laughs> the, the questions we usually ask the guests, we're not going to ask this time because we're already there. Um, but, uh, I, I'm I'm wondering, you know, how to how to go for you guys just quickly, and then uh, and then we'll get to plugging our stuff, whatever this stuff may be. Um, I think this was fun. I uh, yeah, you know, I I love talking about and thinking about these issues, but sometimes, like like Sean, I wish we we I could come up with some actual real answers and solutions, but it's it's difficult stuff. Difficult. Yeah, if our job is to point out that there's a lot of stuff messed up. Boy, we did our job. If our job is to yep. solve some of those problems, I'm not sure we are as effective today. Uh, <laughs> the first step, the first step is identifying the, the problems, right? Yeah. Thank there goodness go. we got to do that part. The next part is somebody <laughs> else's job. That's next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That uh, uh, there used to be a, a I don't know Duck's Breath Mystery Theater still exists, but there was a guy named uh, Merle Kessler whose stage name was Ian Schultz, and he would have these little rapid fire commentaries that were always um, uh, very pointed and so forth. And he, and he just goes into all these problems. He said, "But solving that isn't my job. My job is sarcasm." <laughs> and then he went on about that. Uh, I think I, I'm reminded of actually something my father said about journalists, which I am now. Um, which is they were like weather vanes. They pointed everywhere else, but didn't go anywhere themselves. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here we are, weather vanes in in the midst of things. So, um, so Catherine and I, we, we have the same plug. We have another podcast. It's called yeah. Reality 2.0. It's at reality2cast.com. And and uh, Catherine hosts and produces that. It produces that. Does a great job. Yeah, we we sometimes deviate. We be go a little bit beyond open source. So if you're interested in listening to me yeah, and Doc uh, talk about uh, different issues, technology generally speaking, but uh, not confined to open source, please come check us out. We have a good time. Uh, may, maybe Sean yeah. will join us too. No pressure. But. <laughs> it's all very collegial. It's all very collegial. And Sean, what do you got? To, what do you want to plug? Uh, nothing. Have I been on the show? I don't remember if I've been on reality. I think I was once. I think I was a guest you once have, on your yeah. podcast mm-hmm. a long time yeah. ago. It's anyway. been a while though. It's um, time to come back. Yeah. yeah it's hard I'd, to tell the show from a phone call. So it's, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> no, I, as far as what to plug, I, I don't really have anything I want to plug right now. So, uh, if, if you're curious what's happening in my world, uh, follow me on Twitter on Twitter. I, um, That'll probably be the first place anything exciting that's going on in my world will be posted. I see on, on the screen there is my YouTube page, which is shamefully outdated now. So I have to record some videos, but I say that every time. And so far, it hasn't happened. So my new job is keeping me busy, but that's a good thing. I, I have a theory that nobody is happy with their web page, whatever the web page is. Nobody's happy with theirs. Next week, Aaron Newcomb and I will be talking with Steve Seguin, the creator of O. BS Ninja. It'll be a fun show and we'll see you then. So until next week, uh, uh, I'm Doc Searles. See you then. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to another show here on the Twit Network. If you are a fan of home automation, internet of things, and all things smart technology, you should check out my podcast, Smart Tech Today. I do it with Matthew Casanelli, and we have so much fun talking about all the latest news for all things smart tech. 